Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. We've had pretty much every kind of failure mode you can think of so far on this channel. We've had power supply failures, RAM failures, CPU failures, ULA failures, ULAs that I blew up, and everything in between. Normally, my diagnostic card, which is a Retrolium smart card, comes in very handy for diagnosing these things, but I decided it's time to expand my diagnostic ROM repertoire. Starting off by this Quasar ROM cart, which I was lucky enough to have sent to me. This thing holds a 512KB flash memory chip, which we can load with 16 16KB programs, or if you're lucky enough to have a SAM coupe, you can load it with 16 32KB programs. All we have to do is flash the programs into the chip at the correct memory locations, and then use this clicky twizzly whirly knob to choose any of the 16 banks. 0 through F gives us 16 possible banks. So how exactly does the Spectrum know to read the program from the external ROM as opposed to the internal ROM? Let's take a look at this schematic and highlight the three chips we're interested in, the ULA, the Z80 and the internal ROM chip. The address bus from A0 to A13 connects directly between the Z80 and the ROM chip. As we'll see soon, that allows 16 kilobytes of memory to be addressed. A14 and A15 go directly to the ULA, the ULA performs some logic on these two address lines and generates the active low chip enable signal for the internal ROM chip. The ULA's logic is very simple. The value of the chip enable signal is A14 odd with A15. That means it's only low if A14 and A15 are also low. If either of these is high, then the address that the Z80 is looking at is greater than 16K and we know that it's looking to read data from the RAM as opposed to the ROM. This also explains the 16 kilobyte program size limitation applied to external ROM cartridges. So that explains how the internal ROM is addressed. What about an external ROM? Well, an external ROM cartridge pulls the CE line, chip enable, to high, which permanently disables the internal ROM. And that's pretty much it. All of the address lines go directly to the edge connector and so end up going to the cartridge. The cartridge also receives A14 and A15, as well as MREC, so it knows when the ROM is being addressed. And what about our fancy 16 bank ROM cart? The chip here contains 19 address lines. Let's arrange them in order and do a little bit of binary. We've got A0 through A18. Let's mark the powers of 2 and do a little bit of maths. First of all, by noting down the actual value of each of these powers. You can get the total capacity of the chip by adding up all of these numbers or simply performing this equation 2 to the 19 minus 1 which gives us our highest addressable memory location of 524287 or 512 kilobytes. This chip is actually arranged in 4 kilobyte banks and you can see from the numbers that means A0 to A11 are used to address the memory location within the bank and A12 through A18 give us the 7 bits necessary to select one of the 128 banks. This arrangement is only really important when you come to program the chip. What we want to do is use it as if it has 16 kilobyte banks. And as we saw before, that means we need to use A0 through A13 to be able to select 16 kilobytes worth of memory locations. And that's why you find that all 14 of these address lines are connected directly to the edge connector by the interface 2 that you're using to connect the cartridge. Which leaves us with A14 through A18 to select one of the 16 banks. This twizzly knob is used to do that and it only actually affects A15 through A18. A14 is connected directly to ground on the edge connector. And that's how it works. So what we need to do now is program the chip. Now get yourself a PLCC extractor tool like this. In fact, get a better one than this. And definitely don't use tweezers because you'll scratch the chip. As you'll see here, there are some scratches where I tried to use tweezers. Whereas with this extractor tool, all you have to do is stick it in the slot, squeeze it, and the chip comes out. And there it is. Take note of the chip type written on the top because you're going to need to find a data sheet in order to program it, or at least to tell your chip programmer which kind of chip you've got plugged in. Now I did try to use an Arduino. I really tried but it's hard to get these things to program. You have to send a load of bytes in the right order to the right memory addresses in order to unlock it before you write every byte. So it got really painful and in the end, I bought myself a chip programmer. And honestly, now I've been using it, I realize it's an essential tool. 
I easily wasted a few evenings trying to get the Arduino project to work and this thing does it in about one second. You just plug in the USB here, pop the chip in the top in the Ziffy connector and press go basically, as long as you've set the software up correctly. You might be thinking that there's no way I can get that PLCC chip in there, but with this adapter thingy it goes in really easily. This thing was dead cheap and I did buy it for the Arduino idea and luckily the arrangement of the pins and outputs is perfectly matched to what the software expects and here's the software, which is very easy to use. You just go to the chip select menu, type in the ID of the chip or the type of the chip that you're trying to flash, uh, select it and press OK. And you can see that the working window fills up with an uh, FF, which is just blank basically. You can click on read and there it is, there's a little diagram of what you should be looking at. Press read, it takes a couple of seconds and it fills up with data. This chip already has some ROMs burned to it because I've been messing around with it. So there's the data that I previously burned. Or should I say flashed? There's the data I previously flashed. So let's load some data in. I've got a couple of bin files of diagnostic ROMs one from Retrolium and one from Brendan Alford. Let's start with the Retrolium diagnostic ROM. You select the ROM and press open and it's going to ask you some questions. You need to choose the format of the file, you need to choose the start address of uh, the memory location that you want to flash to on the chip, which is a useful thing to be able to do if you've got 16 banks you need to flash to. And then I disable this clear buffer so it doesn't delete everything else that I've loaded into the other banks and there it is, it's loaded in. And as you'll see as I scroll down there are other ROMs loaded in starting at the correct addresses to match the start of each 16 kilobyte bank. In fact I've not only put diagnostic ROMs on here, I've also set it up to flash as many of the official ROM cartridges that were released from Sinclair that are available at the moment. So let's click program and see what happens. Well not much happens, um, the little yellow light's going to come on and then it's going to say it's finished and it'll take about one second instead of the many evenings I spent on the Arduino. Okay, maybe a few seconds. There we go, it's finished now. One last check, I'll read back the contents, make sure it's gone in correctly. And we'll see while it's reading, the little yellow light comes on to tell me it's doing something and the working window will fill up with everything that I wanted to see. Lovely. Alright, let's try it out. I have a RAM Turbo interface here. I don't actually have an official issue too, but this does the trick. And I'm going to use this Spectrum Plus that I refurbished in an earlier video. And it works. Brilliant. Now I have another diagnostic ROM at my disposal. Although I believe with the interface too, I can only use this on 16K, 48K Spectrums. So we're going to have to create something for 128K as well, which we'll do a bit later on. Let's just try a different bank by turning around the Twizzly thing, popping it back in and seeing what happens. We should see chess load up. Yep, there it is. This is one of the few official games that was released on the Sinclair ROM cartridges. Another one being Horus and the Spiders. Now, if anyone can tell me why they chose that, I'd like to know because it is terrible. Alright, what about a solution that will work on 128k machines as well? For that I bought these ROM chips which you can replace the internal ROM with. And with this programmer it's very simple, just a case of flashing the diagnostic ROM bin file directly to the chip and it's done. In fact I did two, I now have a Retroleum ROM and the Brendan Alford ROM. So if I ever have a machine that needs some work with a socketed ROM chip or you know I could always just socket the chip myself, I can pop one of those in and I think that's the best way to diagnose because it removes all the links in the chain with interfaces and edge connectors. So I pulled this old piece of junk down off the shelf which happens to have a socketed ROM chip and I do know this machine works so it should just work fine and show me the diagnostic program. Maybe I should label these chips up because that looks very similar to the one I just took out. Anyway here we go. Well hey brilliant, another diagnostic ROM solution. I feel a lot more comfortable now having these at my disposal. I think having as many tools around you as you can is going to increase your chances of repairing the machine. Well, I hope you found that interesting. Thank you all for watching. Please share the channel if you're enjoying it.